our next, thanks Jimmy, our next presenter, presenters are uh, Damien Ebert and uh, Todd, M Damien Ebert from Pacificorp and Todd McConnell from ENS Environmental. And they're gonna be talking about uh, thermal data collection from JC Boyle Dam to Copco Reservoir, overview and uses. So Damien. All right, good morning. Great. Looks like Randy has not re-enabled my, my video. That's fine. We see your presentation well. Good. Um, there. Okay. Well, then I'm, there we go. All right, then I'm just going to carry on. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Eli. I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about some work we did last fall on the reach between J.C. Boyle Dam and Copco Reservoir. And, uh, and I've tried to connect it to Randy's initial theme there of uh, the adaptive management and the long-term management goals, because that's, I think, where this is ultimately going to head. So quick outline, uh, you know, where we were working, why we're doing what we were doing, the what and the how, uh, a little bit of when, and then some results and next steps. And I think it's those next steps that are going to probably be the most important. So where everybody knows, I think uh, I almost didn't put this slide in, right? Because everybody knows the Klamath, but uh, we're focused on that reach from J.C. Boyle Dam downstream uh, to the headwaters of Copco Reservoir. So that's about 22 river miles, um, roughly river miles uh, 202 and 240, 224. Those bright green dots on that reach there uh, become important later. Those were where we had our calibration data loggers. The flow regime in this reach is the Y. So we know that there are roughly 200 CFS of uh, cold water spring input between JC Boyle Dam and the powerhouse. Uh, the powerhouse is right here on this, this corner. So, but what we did not know is where specifically that water was reaching uh, the stream channel. We, you could see it as you drive down along the canal road. You can stop at various places and see the water quality actually change. The color of the water changes as those clean springs come into the, uh, the water coming out of boil, but the, the volume in any one specific location is, is unclear. So then also dam removal is gonna change the flow regime in this reach, right? The, um, the reach between JC Boyle Dam and the powerhouse now, so this, um, this few miles of channel right here is currently experiences a stable, it's bypassed, that's the bypass reach, it, and it experiences a relatively stable uh, flow regime with about 100 CFS coming out of JC Boyle Dam, and then the additional spring inputs. And then downstream of the powerhouse, uh, we run JC Boyle Powerhouse in a peaking mode, meaning we peak flows out of there uh, to meet power production demands. And so the flows in this section of the river all the way down into Copco um, fluctuate dramatically over the course of the day from, you know, 350-ish CFS to over uh, 1,600 uh, or, or more given power demands. So when you remove the project, boil and the downstream dams, we suspect that flows will be managed out of Kino further upstream they won't have power peaking capacity. That, that won't be part of what they're going to do. So you'll end up with higher flows in this bypass reach and then more stable flow regime uh, in the peaking reach. So that change in flow will dilute, has the potential to dilute spring flows in the, um, in the bypass reach and create more stable flow conditions in the in the peaking reach and then throw some climate change on top of that. Um, we know the Klamath gets warm anyways, uh, water temperature wise, water coming out of Keno is gonna be in the mid twenties degrees C during the summertime. Um, thermal refuge for spring run Chinook, for juvenile coho, uh, steelhead, uh, resident red band are going to be pretty important and the the bypass reach in those springs have the potential to create that habitat. But if you're changing the availability of that habitat by changing that flow regime, um, then maybe there's something that can be done to protect that. 
So this is the why I mentioned, these are spot water temperatures downstream of Kino, and you can see that in the summertime over the last 20 years, um, routinely exceed 20 degrees C. Uh, and that, you know, that'll continue, Kino stays in place, operations will be the same at Kino uh, under reclamations management as they are now for Pacific Corps, um, you know, so that those water temperatures are gonna be the same that are gonna be coming into this reach. So we funded this measure uh, last summer. Uh, Humboldt State had a, uh, a project working with NIMPS and others to do this using uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, we were going to support that and ran into some corporate cybersecurity issues. So we uh, went to uh, Tom McDonald at ENS Environmental and said, hey, can we do this with a, let's just put a camera on a helicopter and, and do this all at the same time. So we, we did that. Todd worked with Musa Diabat at NV5 Geospatial. We mounted a forward looking infrared camera on a helicopter and um, got everything in place to fly this entire reach and collect uh, thermal data on the water surface temperature uh, during that flight. Todd and his crew put uh, those four thermographs you saw earlier out into the river uh, for calibration of the data collected by that camera. So like I said, this is last summer, of course, we did our contracting was in August. Data collection is best during those warmest parts of the year. So you want to maximize the differential between the surface water temperatures and the, and the surrounding terrestrial habitat. So you can't do this in the spring when your terrestrial habitats, you know, 15 degrees and your water is 15 degrees, you don't know where your water ends. So the NV5 prefers to fly these in July and August. Um, we tried twice in August. Um, this aerial photo here from satellite image from the middle of August, we all remember what last summer was like. Um, we had our helicopter in the air or at Medford and got turned around twice uh, by poor flying conditions. So we finally managed to get it done in late September. Uh, during the annual J.C. Boyle outage. One of the other constraints on this whole process was that we provide whitewater boating flows downstream of Boyle, so those peaking activities are important for those uh, uh, whitewater boat act operators. And we can only, you know, shut those people down with so much notice so many times uh, over the course of the summer. So we tried a couple of times uh, and had to turn around and then waited until uh, the outage at the end of September and, and flew things at that point. So this is what we got. We have a seamless mosaic for the entire study reach at a third of a meter resolution. It's a it's an amazing data set. When you pull it up into GIS and you start um, you know fiddling around through it and looking at it, um, it's it's pretty, you can spot all of these features. So this happens to be the mouth of the Shovel Creek. You could see Shovel Creek come in here, this colder water plume showing up in these darker colors, extending down the left bank uh, for, uh, it's pushing 150 meters, I think, when I actually measured it on the, in, in GIS. And, and these features show up throughout um, the project reach. So, You know, we end up with this individual features buffered by a, a one meter circle and then temperatures generated within that circle. We also get a longitudinal profile at 10 meter spacing where each 10 meter dot is the average of the temperatures measured for five meters on either side of that. So you, um, you get a complete longitudinal profile, you get temperatures for each of your thermal features of which we had 116 were identified. Uh, and this is actually how the data looks in, in, uh, in GIS when you pull it in. So the, S, the thermal feature selection is um, a little bit of professional opinion chosen on that. You'll see like on the, on this side over here, there's, there's two and then, but there's no feature here for whatever reason it was decided that that didn't meet the criteria to be considered um, considered a feature. And we're doing some work now to, to group these, um, perhaps bundle them into 
larger complexes of, of springs because there's like between these two, there could just be a boulder right here that is separating those two features. And they're really the same spring groundwater input. Um, flows during this time were relatively stable, about 550 CFS because the powerhouse was offline and we were uh, spilling at JC Boyle. This is what that longitudinal temperature profile looks like uh, from Boyle Dam on the left to Copco Reservoir on the right. All of those thermal features are those orangish squares for the spring water inputs. And then you can see the major tributaries there uh, in the, the blue diamonds. Uh, and I think the take home message here, right, is uh, downstream of Boyle running, you know, 16 ish, 16, two degrees C, and then you get a massive drop uh, downstream, just a, a couple of kilometers uh, of a degree and a half where all those cold water springs come in. And then the water gradually warms back up to fifth, just below 15, which it kind of holds all the way down until you hit Copco Reservoir. The other way to look at that longitudinal profile is, uh, is this way, it's just a color ramp map of that reach. You can see water coming out of boil, pretty warm, turns the first couple of corners, and then we get uh, that water temperature dropping, stays relatively cool until you get downstream of the powerhouse and then gradually starts to pick up uh, temperature as it moves on down into Copco. Here are those features. They're, um, you know, like I said, scattered throughout the study reach, but obviously concentrated in that bypass reach. Um, we're thinking about these now, working on some prioritization metrics to figure out where we're going to study next in specifics. And personally think that some of these in the downstream end uh, will be, you know, probably as important as those in the bypass reach to returning salmonids. You don't want to create, it'd be nice to be able to maintain some spots in the river where fish can move between them uh, and they're not stuck in, you know, kilometer after kilometer of uh, relatively warm water without suitable habitat. So this just up close, you know, um, we're able to calculate fun things like temperature differentials from the features uh, to the uh, center line. This is immediately downstream of JC Boyle Dam, that first big corner. There's, I don't know, 16 or 18 features that come in right along this side. And you can see the that whole complex, you know, kind of stretches along this bank uh, all the way down. Uh, further downstream of the bypass reach, the image on the left there, you see the power canal uh, at the top of the slope in our access road. And then this is um, uh, close to sidecast slide area, but you can see over the course of, uh, you know, 150 or so meters, we get about two and a half degrees C of cooling just based on uh, was it four mapped features, which is, uh, it's a pretty substantial uh, drop in temperature. So next steps, we are uh, a few things. We have a technical advisory group in place. We've been meeting uh, intermittently over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, participation from NIMPS, uh, ODFW, Cal Fish and Wildlife, uh, and then myself and our team. And what we want to do is figure out a handful of things. So we're trying to prioritize features because where we can do some further study because we only have so much time and money. And so we can't go look at all 116 of these. And so we want to pick those where either we could theoretically do some <clears throat> habitat improvement or habitat protection to ensure that that cold water doesn't mix with a higher more stable flow regimes that uh, will be following uh, dam removal. So we need to do some prioritization to narrow our, uh, our work scope down. And then we're gonna go back and do some detailed inflow assessments to try to figure out where those larger springs or spring complexes actually are. Because, <clears throat> you know, if, if your spring's only putting in a trickle, it's probably not worth spending a lot of time and energy trying to uh, protect that trickle of cold water at this point uh, in the system, in the, in the process. We'd rather have a larger, protect those larger features that provide more quality habitat um, for returning fish. So once we do those inflow assessments, get our prioritization done, we'll know exactly which sites we're looking at. Um, we can then go out and do some site-specific habitat evaluation work, um, you know, looking at 
the actual fish habitat, the riparian, uh, the channel characteristics around uh, those specific features. This is not an easy area to work in. Uh, it is uh, extremely remote and it's also extremely steep in a lot of places. And so, you know, you look at this picture and this is um, the peaking reach upstream of uh, Copcoa ways and that green dot is a thermal feature in the lee of that island. But a lot of those rocks on the uh, river right there are, you know, probably half the size of Volkswagens or, or bigger. And so, and there's no roads to this particular location. So getting to these places to do any follow up work is a challenge. And, you know, access is certainly going to be one of our prioritization metrics. And then, you know, depending on how those first two or three steps go, uh, there's a possibility to do some additional thermal monitoring, right? We we have one data point now, right? With one flight at the end of September, we could put a camera on the helicopter, do it all again, theoretically do it at a different flow regime uh, if we can manage the water that way. Uh, or we can do some site-specific thermal monitoring either with thermograph arrays or locally mounted uh, infrared cameras or, or some other stuff. And then there's also discussion of uh, flow and water quality modeling. We're doing some work to identify uh, floodplains that may be accessible at different flow regimes right now. Uh, and then we're gonna overlap those with the thermal features. And if there's some cross up there, then perhaps those features also uh, are worth looking at um, down the road. So we'll see how far our money gets uh, and how far our time gets uh, this summer. So the report's available on our website. I'll actually drop the direct link to it in the chat when we're done with this talk. Um, and I need to thank Todd and uh, Musa. We couldn't have done this work without them, as well as support from the uh, Interim Measure Implementation Committee and, and obviously the funding that Pacific Corps provides to that. So that's my talk. Happy to entertain any questions. If there are any. All right, thanks. Thanks, Damien. Thanks for powering K-Bomb's greatness today. <laughs> Somebody's gotta do it. <laughs> yes. Um, Jimmy has a comment, uh, Jimmy Faulkner. Um, Damien, wow, I was super impressed to see this presentation. It didn't disappoint. It is as cool as it sounds. Uh, how expensive is this? Any other plans to do other sections of the plan? So, um, anytime you put a helicopter in the air, it's going to cost you uh, quite a bit of money. So I think our initial flight was in the $65,000 range. That includes data processing, data QA, report prep through to the final product. Um, at this point, we do not, Pacific Corps doesn't have any plans to do other sections of the Klamath. Um, I think, you know, we chose this particular area because that's where we knew uh, there were, you know, a lot of spring inputs, a lot was going to be an important area for recolonization. Um, but we don't have any plans to, to do other sections at this point in time. And I'll just jump in here to say that there has been, um, previous flights around the basin. There was, there was one in, in this reach, I think back in the early two thousands. And then I think the Scott river and Shasta river have each, or I think the Scott rivers had two flights and Shasta River one flight. Um, I don't remember. I don't know that the Lower Klamath has. Um, and then also the Trinity, um, what they call the Restoration Reach from the dam, I think down to the first first 40 miles, maybe. I don't know if they flew the whole river. So there is um, pieces of this data in other parts. Of the right. um, any other questions for Damien? We are doing good on time here, so I'll leave it open for another little bit here. Um, okay, well, seeing no more questions. Thanks a lot, Damien. Thank you. Yeah.